Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this last uh, Copernicus Accelerator webinar uh, for 2018. Um, we're very glad to welcome you all. Uh, we see that there are many participants today, which is fantastic. Uh, and this webinar will feature a series of entrepreneurial stories from alumni to the Copernicus Accelerator. Uh, they will share with you uh, their experiences, some tips, some best practices on how they got the most out of the Copernicus Accelerator and especially how they moved on after this program making use of all the lessons learned for their Copernicus-based services and Copernicus-based startup. The agenda for today is the following. We have three speakers. We'll start with Pedro Caridade from Space Layer Technologies. He's from Portugal, uh, followed by Gail Milin Chalabi from Envirosar in the UK. Uh, and last but not least, Beryl Sirmacek from Create4D. Um, each of them will speak for about 15 minutes to share their stories. Uh, in between, uh, we can, of course, ask some questions. And at the end, there will be a complete Q&A where you can fire any remaining questions or uh, required advice, let's say, that you still need. This webinar will be available on YouTube after as always. And of course, you can reach out to us if you have any questions after the webinar. Um, but first of all, let's get started with the first story from Pedro. Uh, Pedro, I'm very glad to give you the floor for your presentation. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for the invitation to, to be part of this webinar. Um, I'm Pedro Caridad, I'm co-founder of Space Layer Technologies, and we we have been part of the Copernicus Accelerator in 2016, been finalist of the Copernicus Masters, the DLR Environmental Energy and Health Challenge in that time. So we were in the first batch of the Copernicus Accelerator in 2016. So basically and briefly, our company was funded in July 2015. Uh, we are incubated in IPN, Portugal, uh, through as a big um, initiative in Portugal. Uh, in Portugal, we have three uh, main uh, incubators uh, with uh, ESEPIC, and we are in Coimbra, in the central region of Portugal. And we created the company as a university technological transfer between the research from theoretical chemistry with uh, geography and health that was uh, part of the um, of the the other co-founder that is a geographer. Um, all the, the, the subject that we have been proposed at the time was environmental modeling, geography, and LIT, all combined. And we have been selected by the Firewire Accelerator in that time, 2015, with our first grant that allow us to create <clears throat> the company, uh, also with the ESABIC uh, Incubation Center Portugal. In 2015, we started um, one accelerator with BGI from MIT Portugal, and we received the first prize of the health IT and medical devices, um, being also part of the European Institute of Technology Accelerators, both for health, digital, and lately for climate kick. So basically what we are doing is to monitoring air quality um, in cities, we uh, provide patterns of air pollution in cities so people can avoid the hot spots of the harsh environments and to allow routing in the city. So we started with the Copernicus um, <clears throat> data from the, from the camps, from the Copernicus uh, services. And now we are using the Sentinel-5P for using, for the, the, to, to get better data. And to, to achieve the, the resolution in the city level, we have installed the air quality sensors in moving vehicles and lately we signify uh, also the um, installing smart poles in, in cities. So all the data is combined with machine learning algorithms in which we forecast the pollution and allow routing people in cities. And this was the, the, the project that we have submitted in 2016 and been finalists of the DLR uh, challenge. So before the Copernicus Accelerator, 
uh, we have a pilot developed here in Coimbra where we install the air quality sensors in moving vehicles and use also the CAM services. And our pitch was let's improve health quality. So all, all our business was directed for consumer. Of course, we have a small part that was business to business, but it was a, a really happy uh, feeling saying, okay, we have an app that allows people to use it and to avoid and to take proactive decisions in cities. Of course, immediately we realized that this does not work because people will not willing to pay for the services. And with our mentoring uh, with Pedro Branco that was selected uh, mostly because it has uh, easy contracts at the time. It was an expert on GIS. He was also a very um, successful in SMA instruments. Uh, so we, with him, created a, an outline of our of our project that skip out the business to consumer part and go to business to business, um, which allows us to break even in 2017. Um, so we gain more money than to than we spent, and currently we are in the stage of acceleration. We are very thankful thankful for for Pedro Branco and for the, his mentoring. That still today we combine and um, discuss projects together. So we did not finish when we concluded the, the Copernicus Accelerator in 2016, but we are still working together to to mostly for him to help me then the reverse, but uh, with my network, I can help him uh, getting some other uh, projects. So with all these uh, in mind, we reapply in 2017 and we win the Copernicus Master, the Copernicus World Government Challenge, since all this information was included in a um, in platform for civil protection. Um, we realized that selling information per se is not enough, but including services that are already existing, uh, exist, uh, it was the, the, the key feature that helped us to, to sell all this information. And of course, we did not only use CAMs for the civil protection, um, we create a platform that use in situ data meteor and flood probes, air pollution sensors, our sensors. We use also Sentinel data for coastal and flood characterization, and we are using all the Copernicus services except security. Uh, we combine also the weather forecast and radar imagery that is available through a uh, partnership with a public institution here in Portugal. And then we integrate all the services in a web in mobile. This has been highlighted by Copernicus for Region, by European Commission, ESA and REUS publication. We are one of the 99 cases that is reported um, of the use of Copernicus in regions. And we've been selected in one of the five companies to present the, the work in, uh, in the European Commission. So one of the major learns, learned lessons was, okay, listen to our mentors, listen to everybody because, um, Probably they know a lot more than we do. Um, in our case, we were university researchers and uh, um, Paul was already with the company, but uh, mostly oriented for public sector. And of course, we learn a lot. Learn a lot from the, the webinars, for example, from Piotr webinars in the business developing was really important for us. And of course, also the, um, the Copernicus service data uh, webinars that is also relevant and the tutorials that is on the web. So one thing that we be, should be very careful about is be very humble because lots of people learn, know a, a lot of more than we do. And so uh, it's always a question of learning, learning and learning. And one of the things that we come up from the, the Copernicus uh, Accelerator was network, network, networking. The networking is really important. Um, with the ASIO and Space Tech, we went to the Space App Camp in Barcelona in 2017. We were the, the first finalist uh, there. We did not win, but uh, it was uh, two days of intensive work. We have a platform working uh, from scratch uh, using the SAP services. 
uh, it's also relevant for the, um, the outreach and the visibility of uh, our service, for example, in the Copernicus Info Day. Uh, it was really a pleasure to be invited by Space Tech to be um, present in, in my own country speaking about a service that probably uh, only a few know. Uh, it has been also really relevant participation in the Copernicus user uptake in 2018. And of course, the branding and the awareness was uh, one of the major uh, outcomes that we take from our networking with, um, with, uh, our, with ACO and Space Tech and the Copernicus uh, Accelerated. Right now, we are part of the Copernicus Academy. Uh, we are a Copernicus Academy member, and we are working not only for the public sector, but also for private sector. Uh, currently, we have projects uh, using asphalt integrity assessment. We are using Advantage Tourism. We have an ESA Arts project that is being submitted for a final, full final proposal. Uh, we are working with civil engineering, a uh, project that has been recently uh, been accepted here in Portugal as a, as a big partnership. We are doing the technical development of these, uh, ser these services. And uh, we have also the traditional forest wood and the agriculture field, because although this is not our core business, we are helping companies to use technology um, from space downstream to, to help on this, um, on this business. And of course, we'd like to thank the European Commission, the European Space Agency, the Copernicus, the Copernicus Accelerator, ASIO and Space Tech, because they provide us a tool both for the, for the masters, for the accelerator, and also for the academy. There's a big Portugal, Instituto Pedro Nunes, which is our incubator. I'd like to thank a lot, Pedro Branco, I think that uh, it changed a little bit my mind about uh, how to make business and how to, to tackle problems with business. And of course, our teams, Space Layer and Prime Layer, that are the ones responsible for putting all the know-how that come from research, from fundamental research in, in application in our uh, web services. Thank you very much. So I'm uh, very glad to give the floor to, uh, to Gail who will now, uh, from Envirosar, who will now uh, share her perspective on, uh, on being a mentee in the Copernicus Accelerator, and also, of course, her tips and, and best ideas for all of you to learn from her experiences. So, Gail, the floor is all yours, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. So, um, I'm representing Envirosar, um, our Copernicus Accelerator journey for uh, uh, the 2016 to 2017 year. Um, we're a team based at the University of Manchester Sc uh, School of Environment, Education and Development. And um, I'd like to thank Space Tech for the invitation um, for Envirosar to present today. So it all really began uh, back in July 2016. Um, this is uh, myself and Joanna, um, one of our team members, uh, and we both graduated from our PhDs. Um, we um, have very different backgrounds in terms of discipline. I'm a physical geographer specializing in uh, radar remote sensing, whereas Joanna, um, she um, specializes in um, human geography, um, looking at stakeholder engagement. And we were both discussing ideas around, you know, moorland peatland management um, and um, we had an idea in terms of um, using uh, satellite data for uh, better managing uh, moorlands and peatlands after wildfires. So uh, we looked down the uh, entrepreneurial route and to provide a bit of context around our idea, um, basically uh, Envirosar uh, enhances wildfire resilience in moorlands and heathlands using radar images. Um, so uh, this was my PhD supervisor, Julie McMorrow, and um, the plan was to use uh, Copernicus uh, data, which is updated every um, six days, to really um, monitor both before and after a wildfire 
Um, what's really unique about the Sentinel-1 data specifically is that it penetrates through the cloud and the smoke um, so that we can get some really good regular images. Uh, cloud cover is specifically uh, an issue in UK uh, moorlands and heathlands. Uh, we suffer a lot with cloud cover, so um, often even the Sentinel-2 data doesn't necessarily give us the coverage that, that we need. Um, and the key impacts of the wildfires in these areas um, is uh, both operational costs to put wildfires out, costs roughly around £55 million pounds per annum um, from the fire service, but also discoloration of drinking water, um, loss of um, the um, ecological habitat and releasing large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as well, contributing to global warming effects. And this obviously costs um, both NGOs um, and water companies, conservation groups, a lot of money. So by being able to better detect where there is damage, we can um, then help them to better target reseeding programs and moorland management programs. So we really, I really identified that there was a need for a national monitoring and detection tool of peat moorland and heathland wildfires um, by generating products from earth observation data. This would understand um, helps us to understand both the patterns of wildfire occurrence and UK wildfire regimes so we can better mitigate against wildfire risks, um, target large uh, land management, people and restoration and receding and also reducing water discoloration. The vision for Envirosar is to um, expand this uh, beyond the UK and worldwide um, as we um, develop our customer base. So um, this is just an example here of the Winter Hill wildfire that occurred in the northwest of England on the 29th of June 2018 and burned for a week. So this is prior to the wildfire occurring on the 24th of June and then the start of uh, the burn um, on the 29th of, of June and then um, a second wildfire also began um, in the same vicinity and connected up with the first one. Um, so this is showing the overall uh, burn area uh, by the 4th of July um, of this year. So we really were keen to obtain some support uh, to get the idea of a virus are off the ground. And this is really where the Copernicus Masters uh, program uh, kicked in for us. Um, we uh, applied for this, uh, for the Copernicus Sustainable Living Challenge and was um, the winner of that challenge and was awarded on the 25th of October, 2016 in Madrid, Spain. And for us, this was a chance to get valuable business support and training. Um, we were allocated a mentor, which was Francesco Luigi um, from the Satellite Applications Catapult based in Harwell uh, in the UK. And um, he was really um, very helpful in terms of providing us with um, information around how to do uh, customer validation and developing a minimum viable product. And um, by winning the um, Sustainable Living Challenge, which was supported by the Satellite Applications Catapult, it really increased the visibility of our team um, and, and our idea um, and really allowed us to um, start to develop a, a pilot and um, understand our customers uh, better. So um, in terms of um, tips, I would say um, the first thing is to obtain business training and coaching. So um, the Copernicus Accelerator uh, was fundamental in Envirosar moving from concept stage to startup stage. Um, at the end of the process, we secured C funding by the University of Manchester for £5,000 as part of their Momentum programme. Um, 
and it all began with face-to-face -face coaching in Madrid at the start of the Copernicus Accelerator journey. Uh, this was the first uh, Copernicus Accelerator. And as you can see from the photos, we were able to first of all meet with our mentor um, and discuss our ideas with him and obtain feedback and produce a plan of action. We also were able to meet with um, other um, people from the um, earth observation uh, sector uh, and get feedback from um, uh, about our ideas um, and it also gave us this opportunity to pitch our idea as well um, which was really valuable because we were from an academic background so the type of presenting that we'd done previously wasn't really around pitching, more doing um, uh, academic presentation. And we identified, you know, that our key clients were water companies, insurance companies, landowners um, and NGOs. So um, this was a really valuable process. We were then able to introduce Envirosar um, to um, the uh, satellite applications catapult in Harwell in Oxfordshire as part of one of their Satachino events. This is where they um, bring people from all different industries who are interested in the use and application of satellite data. Um, and again, we were able to pitch Envirosar at this event. Um, we were able to network with people from different industries, um, from marketing, from finance, people who could potentially help us to develop our business. And then um, on the 8th of March um, 2017, um, with Francesco and his team that you can see on the photo here, we um, did a design cave exercise where we kind of wrote out all our ideas and our workflows um, onto the wall um, and captured all the information. And um, after this work, we were equipped with templates that we could use um, and a slide deck uh, for um, approaching potential customers. And then since then, these materials have been used um, during meetings with uh, organisations such as Mars for the Future Partnership in the Peak District National Park in the UK, Yorkshire Water and United Utilities. So this was really very helpful to us. We also were supported by the Science, Technology and Funding Council. Um, so um, they supported us attending the UK Space Conference uh, in 2017 so um, we did a lot of networking during that time um, we were featured as startup of the month on the 10th of June and um, like I said on the 24th of July we became part of the University of Manchester Momentum pro program and was awarded £5,000 to support the business which was really critical for us moving forward with our idea Envirosar was incorporated as a business on the 3rd of March of, of 2017 um, and we completed the accelerator program, the Copernicus accelerator program at the end of July. Um, during that process, we had to complete a, a report uh, with Francesco, our mentor, and this was a really useful exercise in summarizing everything that we'd achieved over that um, mentoring period. Um, and identifying our next steps. Uh, one of those is um, to apply for um, an ESA Business Incubation Centre um, to um, support us in continuing our technical uh, developments, uh, customer engagement and to grow the team. And um, over the summer of 2017, we developed the minimum viable product. Um, so this is just like a quick mock-up of um, bringing in different uh, data associated with wildfires, land cover maps. And so um, 
some of the um, outlook for our company is that um, we um, obtain funding for Copernicus Masters competition but we did this alongside our technical partner Sterling Geo. Unfortunately um, Sterling Geo um, actually um, is no longer a company and so um, we're currently looking for other potential hosting um, platforms as well. So we were going to use their Erdas Apollo software to deliver our, our end products to users. And um, unfortunately, now that um, Sterling Geo isn't a company, we don't have that kind of relationship anymore. Um, so we're looking for other um, ways to do this. So that was one um, potential issue that we've come across. Um, we did um, achieve a lot in 2017, um, obviously completing the accelerator programme. We did a lot of stakeholder engagement, lots of networking activities. Uh, we established a partnership with Moz for the Future. Um, and we developed a minimum viable product during that time. We did apply for the United Utilities Innovation Lab, but again, unfortunately, we wasn't selected in that, but obtained a lot of valuable in, um, feedback. In 2018, um, we have managed to secure our first customer, um, and we've done a lot of research and development with the Sentinel data for um, sort of fire uh, monitoring but of course um, we've not been able to ingest results into a geoportal because as yet we're still looking for what best to use um, now that we're not using Erdas Apollo. Our plans for 2019-2020 is to continue our R&D work with Copernicus data sets um, and to um, apply for an ESABIC at Daresbury in Cheshire um, Previously, ESABIC uh, opportunities were only available in Harwell in Oxfordshire. Um, Daresbury Cheshire is much better for us geographically as we're lo located in the northwest of the UK. So this is um, something that we really would like to go for uh, next year. And also to expand um, our case studies to uh, other areas such as Heathland. So perhaps working with Dorset Heathland Partnership um, and looking at other environmental risks that we can address using SAR and INSAR techniques. Ultimately, um, these are the main benefits um, of EnviroSAR um, to um, our customers. So saving water companies money, um, saving conservation groups time and money through generating burnt area maps um, and adding value by combining existing field data with Copernicus Earth Observation products, um, looking at burned area regeneration rates uh, for restoration. So my tips would be, um, first of all, to um, know your um, USP so for us that was really focusing on using radar data because this penetrates cloud and that is a big issue for um, us in the UK and this builds upon the PhD work that I did um, um, and submitted in 2016. Also to establish a strong multidisciplinary team um, so you know, we, between us, we've got over 10 years of combined experience in remote sensing and stakeholder engagement for carbon management. Because um, it's a um, startup, uh, a lot of the time, you know, we're um, not getting paid uh, for doing this work. So having people that are really committed to the vision of your company is really essential. Um, you know, we've had um, situations where um, team members just unfortunately just don't have any, enough time to put into this and so they've had to take a step back um, from from the work that we're doing um, and obviously the other thing is trying to grow the team as well so there um, is a need really to 
to do that um, for Envirosar at the moment um, as we're uh, developing our business. My third tip is to obtain business training and coaching. So um, the top left picture here is um, the roadmap workshop that I attended at the University of Manchester. Um, and um, this was a really good uh, starting point and enabled me to think about applying for um, the Copernicus Masters competition. And then obviously thereafter having the Copernicus Accelerator program, which allowed us to attend business trainings as well over in Daresbury, um, supported by the Science Technology Funding Council. Um, we also were put in touch with um, marketing companies too. And uh, this has been really uh, helpful to getting our brand um, out there. Fourth tip is to attend a uh, networking event. So um, I would really say, you know, share your idea and obtain feedback, listen to others from different disciplines and backgrounds. Um, this was an opportunity um, for Envirosar to present at Innovate UK. Um, and this was great for introducing Envirosar to the UK business market and also um, for learning about uh, funding opportunities that were available at the time. My fifth tip is um, to market your work to gain new customers. So um, this year, the UK experienced an unprecedented uh, wildfire season. Uh, which sparked a range of media interest in Envirosar and what we do. Um, as a result of these high profile interviews on BBC Breakfast and BBC Radio 5 Live um, and the BBC uh, One Show, which is a primetime TV show in the UK at seven o'clock uh, in the evening. Um, this resulted in um, obtaining our first customer. Um, and so really you know this was one of the uh, main targets at the end of the Copernicus Accelerator program to secure a customer so this was great news for us um, and like I said in 2019 we aim then to complete our second target out of the Copernicus Accelerator program which is to apply for an ESABIC uh, to accelerate the research and development activities for the business so um, Thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd like to just thank um, the European Commission, the European Space Agency, the Copernicus Accelerator team, the Satellite Applications Catapult, uh, the Science Technology Funding Council, the University of Manchester and the University of Manchester Intellectual Property for all their support um, over these past couple of years uh, in developing Envirosar. Thank you. Hi, I'm Berit and uh, I'm the developer of the Farmer app and uh, this all process has uh, built with support of Copernicus program and uh, of course everything's built with my company but uh, I mean when I started I was just one person alone with a dream and I didn't have any action plan to uh, know how to actualize my dream and uh, I was so lucky I was selected to Copernicus um, Masters uh, Accelerator program where uh, in the year 2016 when I was also a finalist of the DLR environmental um, challenge and um, uh, I went one year uh, process of accelerator program by being coached um, with my mentor from uh, Isa Nordwijk in the Netherlands. And uh, Copernicus program uh, supported me during the program also with webinars and uh, contacting me constantly, asking me what I need and how I can reach to potential customers to get some feedback during the development process to ask my questions about how should I take my right actions. So things rolled down perfectly and finally uh, my dream app came to the app store 
uh, where it reached to a few thousands of users at the moment and um, that incredible process happened and uh, I would like to introduce what I'm talking about what's the app and uh, I would like to tell you a little bit more about my personal experience how the process should be taken in order to achieve successful results in my perspective of course that wouldn't apply to everyone in the same manner maybe but um, it might give you some ideas about how to uh, make the best of your startup and make best of the Copernicus Master Program, Accelerated Program especially, which is offered you for free. I mean, it's a great opportunity. Let's uh, see how the Farmer app works because um, it's my greatest passion. I've worked with satellite data so long and I observed that it's some reason too difficult to reach the satellite data. Uh, when you uh, receive the image, you need to use it with special software products and uh, to generate maps. Those maps cannot be opened by, um, by the farmers easily, cannot be um, related to what's actually going on on the land uh, directly. So uh, I want to bring the satellite data to make useful product on the land. And uh, I really visited farmers, uh, dropped down most of the time without any appointment. I mean, it, it looked crazy, but I just uh, stopped with my car and knocked their doors. Can I ask you a question? What are you doing at the moment? And um, uh, they, they, they were surprised, but they were really eager to show me what they did uh, with, with their current uh, situation. Uh, most of them use satellite data. Most of them benefit from the services. But those services, uh, most of the time, are on computers. And when they got false colored images and they go out to try to relate it with the land, they cannot uh, uh, relate what's going on in the field. For instance, they see a plant dying, some areas, a uh, soil behaving differently. Uh, they cannot relate the map that they've seen in the office with the land when they're outside. They go to office, they come back to the land, they go back to office to see the map again, they go out to land. That's not practical. That's not, um, I mean, the information is there, but not useful. So uh, what I really wanted to create, uh, sort of inspired by Pokemon, uh, I wanted them to use an, the app and uh, with augmented reality, uh, they see what's missing in the land, in the soil, what's going on with the vegetation, what kind of disease it is. Uh, just like when you see Pokemon in the app, you should be able to see uh, with your smartphone without going to your office back and forth. And uh, things must be very simple for the person who is in, in the uh, land. So Farmer app really created this from satellite data content. Here the green tag you see is the sudden vegetation density change. And likewise, the irrigation need change, disease change are all mapped with uh, geo tags. I called augmented reality tags uh, sometimes, uh, I say. Uh, they, they are converted to tags which user can see with augmented reality and go towards to see oh, what's going on here. Is the vegetation dying? Is, is, does it need more water? Is there is a disease? All the information comes from satellite and uh, they come to augmented reality. And um, of course, these market needs I was not aware of when I started because I just had the idea about how I want to visualize the data and make it more practical for anyone to, uh, to reach. But I didn't know how to make it business. And uh, this is the first thing that you can benefit from accelerated program because um, when you get an idea and don't know actually how it could be business, you really need to do market analysis and you need to uh, develop uh, how this service should operate as a workflow. And when I uh, check the market needs by support of uh, 
accelerator program and my mentor, the market needs for my specific area, it might be different for your case, but for my area was reliability of the service that you can really expect. I mean, if it's saying vegetation is dying, you must be having reliable information. It shouldn't be uh, misleading you. And you need sustainable service. What it means, I mean, if uh, my I can benefit from this service this year, I must sort of trust that I can get the service again next year too so that must be sustainable service in long term and affordability of course i mean i shouldn't be given thousands of euros to an app that must be affordable for me to uh, reduce my expenses not to just level them up but reduce them and coverage i, I need to reach to a lot of customers preferably all around the world. Extendability was the another thing which a uh, user wants to get the data to their computer, get the data to their tractor or other robotics. Um, might be different in your case, but just check if your users need extendability or not, and what kind of supports your users are needing. Do they need a person to reach? Do they need a chatbot? Or what kind of support do they need to find out? And you must be able to provide it within your uh, workflow. So these were my needs and uh, in, in my market needs that I determined within the program. and. Um, uh, I, I found that I can really uh, develop those, uh, develop, develop a framework which uh, satisfies those needs because um, satellites turn around the world and they co cover all data all around the world. I can provide data uh, to any customer all around the world. They are sustainable. I mean, satellites are there for years and years. They, they, are, they are operating for long time. Uh, period they are reliable as a measurement source and um, of course uh, uh, with the uh, app service I developed I, I provided users APIs to extend the services and uh, yeah a little bit about the app it uh, just generates the calculations from satellite data and afterwards the tags the red points here you see are the sudden change so the attention areas that users should be guided to find out what's going on and they can just look around with the app to see uh, what's needed and go there to um, support uh, their land and these are some uh, use case scenarios that we uh, just ask to test users and uh, these are some numbers indicated by precision farming. They can really increase their yields. They can decrease the chemical reduction. They can have less disease, less weed, and of course, the less environmental footprint. And this also comes back to my heart when I, where I started. I mean, this is the end result, but it makes me back to where I started because uh, all the story started in my heart uh, because I wanted to create something which uh, supports the envir environment and uh, reduces the unnecessary chemical uh, usage. I really wanted to support something uh, which provides good impact to uh, prevent climate change going on, climate change effects. and. Um, well, everything started from this and just circled around and uh, here comes back to where I started, to my heart. And uh, yeah, some additional features of my own app. It also allows users to create their own augmented reality text with photos that I can now apply machine learning algorithms. And um, you know, I, I just wanted to add a little bit more uh, about my personal experience. First thing, uh, really uh, write down why you do what to do. And uh, why do you want to create this business? I mean, is it, is it only for making money? 
probably you can find easy ways to make money. I, indeed, I mean, you can maybe play a guitar or I don't know, not, not because it's easy, but uh, business is extremely challenging. I mean, uh, creating a startup, especially in, in this remote sensing field, uh, creating a startup is extremely challenging. And even after startup period, when your business grows, it will be challenging lifelong. It will not become easier. I mean, you see Facebook, for instance, it's not a startup company. It's a huge company at the moment. And every day you see the re news about what problems Facebook is dealing with. It's likewise for all big businesses, small businesses, you, you will be dealing with a lot of problems all the time. If you don't love what you do, I mean, if you don't have the courage coming from your heart, you will not be able to make it. Your, your startup will uh, stop, will fail within a year or two maximum. So it's, it's, it's just a dream, just um, give up if you don't have uh, this big desire in your heart. And really, I mean, you can just meditate on it or you can uh, make walks in the nature, talk with yourself, write it down. Why do I want to do that? Write it down and come up with your reasons. My reasons were, uh, were the reasons why I live. That, that's much passionate to me. I, I'm vegan. I'm so much passionate about contributing to nature and uh, it makes me cry if I see plants are dying, if I see water resources are reducing, if I see ice are melting, uh, polar bear, bears are having trouble, I mean animals are suffering and um, food is not nutritious enough for people, diseases are growing, those kind of climate things and how it affects people, environment, animals, it makes me cry. And find a reason to make you this startup. It must be a reason that makes you cry. Literally, if you come to that point, you come to your reason that makes you cry, then you've got really power that, that will make you create this business. And it will take you years, years far ahead. Uh, you, nothing can stop you if you really find this passion. Otherwise, the first challenge that you have, some legal issue or some papers that you didn't like, some competitors, uh, some other financial challenges going on will stop you. You will not be able to make it. That's, that's a clear, that honest picture. First of all, start with your why. And that why must be something that makes you cry. That's my personal uh, suggestion to you to look at. And how to benefit from accelerated program the best is really follow those workshops, reach to people in, in the program, in Copernicus Master's program. That is the best community. I mean, I'm not telling you because I'm here. I'm telling you because I experienced that. This is the best community that can lead you to right people in terms of business partners, in terms of collaborators, in terms of customers, in terms of where to find resources, education that you need to develop your further expertise. That's the best community that you can find out. So ask questions. How can I find a customer to test my product? Then they will guide you. How can I find this mentor to ask these questions? They will find you. Get in touch with people in Copernicus Master Program as much as you can. Go to activities, workshops, and meet people. This is the best place to be. And uh, regarding to mentor, uh, I was really lucky. I found it very lucky. I mean, uh, I, I found... Uh, I have selected my mentor very close to my location. That time it was uh, one hour traveling distance to me. And um, I met my mentor literally uh, every week. If I was not able to meet, I was doing Skype, but I really tried my best to go to him, to sit with my mentor and uh, to lay out what I did, 
what's my business plan what's my next action steps and he was asking me right questions most of the time difficult questions i was not really very cheerful every time when i meet my mentor because he was asking me very difficult questions but those were the questions which i really needed to put my focus to make the business happen and uh, it's very beneficial to select a mentor if you're in the accelerator program that you can reach uh, within your uh, physical reach i mean if you if, if i was uh, with a mentor who is from another country probably it would be uh, less beneficial to me i really got benefit of physically meeting my mentor sitting on the table putting all the stuff showing all uh development stages of the app getting feedback constantly so that was incredibly beneficial so these are my experience and uh, you see my um twitter link and um, uh, website on on the screen uh or you can find me on linkedin uh, to ask you further questions. I'd be delighted to answer you if I can support you. And th these are my personal experience with the program. I really thank everyone who were in the process and who are still there uh, or who will be there in the future. I thank you a lot. I mean, that, that's not uh, one person work. That's something that we did together. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Beril, for this super engaging and super inspiring uh, presentation from your side. I mean, it's very clear that you have a passion for what you are doing, and, and I think you're an inspiration for all of us. Um, uh, so this was the last presentation, everyone. I, I think, uh, or I hope at least, that it's been very um, informative and that it's giving you the, the extra push, let's say, to, to absolutely go for your startup and your Copernicus-based services. We do have a bit of time left. So I suggest that we use that for a Q&A session. I, I've seen that there are some questions already in the chat. Um, uh, and let's have a look. The very first question we got here is whether any of you has a further experience with investors. Um, Beril, maybe you can answer this I, I've been talking to investors and um, well uh, not really having experience because I didn't uh, sign any agreement with uh, any of them and as I said I've got a reason which is um, more than uh, money uh, and my focus is always uh, finding a connection heart to heart because I'm doing this stuff uh, it comes from my heart and uh, I will agree with an investor when I see really he's also burning with, with the same passion. He's also crying for what I'm crying. He's also waking up for the same reason. Maybe, maybe I will not find it. <laughs> and that, that's fine. But um, that's what I'm looking for. When you're looking at the investor, maybe list the criteria. What do you want from an investor? And, and that, that shouldn't be only money. I mean, if, if it's only money, you can just go to a bank. And probably if you're in the Netherlands, for instance, Robobank gives a lot of money to just, uh, for instance, what I'm doing, the agriculture. If it was only money, you can rent money from bank. It must be possible. Or I don't know, you can probably find some grants at some point. And uh, investor writing must be a little bit also like a father, a mother to business who can really put some, uh, also some ideas and uh, may, maybe write down what do you expect uh, from an investor yourself. If, if it's only money that you say, you can also rent it from bank. Probably you want more from investor, write it down. And when you are talking to an investor, talk from your heart to heart. It's not like, uh, give me money, I do my job and see what happens uh, later. I, I think it's um, when we are signing things, we are getting responsibility of very long term uh, process. And uh, I, I want to put a signature on something when uh, I see really a heart to heart connection on more items than money. Thank you so much, Pedro. I can see that 
Isaac is already agreeing with you. Um, Pedro or, or Gail, do you have any experiences yourself or something you would like to, to add? Well, I think that uh, that uh, that she's sp spoken everything. Uh, I had some experience in contact uh, um, some investors, and uh, what uh, in early stage, very early stage. So I had a company six months after I was looking for finance and for uh, to raise some money. Uh, I had the opportunity due to the MIT Portugal event to be in contact with. Uh, with the investors but at the time is always very difficult to find investments when you don't have a minimal viable product or and clients if you have clients it's uh, it's already a, a good way to show to them if you don't have clients then you cannot go to invest well you go to the investment but it's business angels and it's a small seed and uh, I think that one way to solve the problem, and I, I realize that someone is also asking questions, uh, is that if you have clients, uh, probably you don't need to uh, raise money so, so, so harsh. Uh, and then you can think about in raising money when you have clients. So if you have clients, uh, I think that everything come up uh, naturally. Uh, if you are looking just for money, it's going to be very difficult. And like Cheryl told, uh, try to look what, are, what you are looking for. If you are looking for just money, money will burn in two or three months. And then you are again in the process of earning more. If you have clients and if you have a smart guy mentoring, then I think that is much worth than just to get money and burn it. Thanks a lot for that uh, extra advice, Pedro. Gail, do you have any comments from your side or personal experiences? Experiences in terms of investments, um, some experience in terms of developing partnerships with other commercial entities. Um, and I found that actually you have to take care with that because sometimes they may appear um, kind of more um, commercially robust than what they truly are. So um, you need to take care who you partner with, I would say, like look at the background of, a, of another company, because that is something that may be offered. And obviously that's something that, you know, we came across on our development journey. Thankfully, we hadn't really signed into any agreement, so it didn't affect us when that particular company was no more. Um, but I agree um, with what Pedro was saying, um, really developing a strong customer base um, where, um, you know, they, they are really interested in the products that you're providing. And uh, like I said, co-production, I think is key as well, like going to the key um, customers and, and really finding out what is it exactly that they want and ca is that something that you can deliver um, and for that you know it takes a lot of hard work and um, a lot of time which isn't going to really be paid for you're not really going to get money from it but what you're getting is a deep understanding of their problem and um, how you can help them I think this potentially, you know, it could take many years to achieve. It's not something that will happen overnight. This is um, a long term process if you're really interested in developing a business that is, is going to achieve what the customer needs. Um, and also it will be fluid. It will change over time as well. Um, situations change over time data sets that are available will evolve the requirements will evolve so actually this is always ongoing and so it's really a two-way communication between you the business and the potential clients um, and if you produce good work for them then they're going to come back and use you again and will also say positive comments about your business and so there is something to be said for getting some initial investments to get your business going. But I would say for that, 
I would advise more to go down the route of some grants for research and development work initially, um, rather than people who are just going to invest in your business so that you have a real kind of target of what it is that you want to achieve like this is a piece of research and development work and I'm going to apply for a grant so in the UK there's a number of avenues for that one of those is Innovate UK they provide a lot of R&D grants and um, and you can also partner up as well with say um, research groups um, and there's usually some R&D pot of money for commercial companies to get involved as well. Um, so there's different avenues um, but ultimately uh, I would say really developing that strong customer base is, is, is the key. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we have we have one one last question, which is um, uh, particularly or especially addressed to Pedro, um, person asking that you shift from B two C to B two B, which is what this person is actually doing, and they were wondering if you could explain how you did that, how you got the lead, um, how did you contact the customer, and how did you first decide on the price? Well, <clears throat> it's good to see my fellows from Mateo around here. I think that they are a good company. Um, my advice is the following. Uh, of course, we had a long tradition in a previous company working on, on, uh, on the municipality basis. Um, just be careful with municipalities because they can put the company in big problems, uh, especially when you have bankrupt bankruptcy like we had in Portugal in 2011. So um, when we are going from business to business, um, the thing that you should, again, like I told before, try to first, first find the, the specific vertical that you are tackling and see who are the most relevant uh, players around. Uh, and then try to, to find in some uh, connection and try to get some meeting in the decision making, not the, the president, but one person that can uh, take you to, to the proper place and speak with them. So this is one thing that uh, we have done. Um, the customer contact, it's like that, because we need to show to them uh, directly or indirectly. Uh, one project that we have with the Signify is that we are using cross sales. So they are selling electric poles and they sell our uh, air quality monitoring services to, to customers that buy their, their so clean, their clean situation. And uh, the price, well, it depends on what we are doing. Of course, we can always make some arrangement about prices. We fix the price in our solutions, uh, although we have some flexibility um, to, to make some discounts and they like discounts. So I think that is one way, but we fix the, pro the price. Thanks a lot uh, for that, Pedro. Um, that brings us to 6 p.m., which is the end of the webinar, unfortunately. Uh, if there are any further questions, do feel free to write us at hello at accelerator.copernicus.eu and we will gladly pass your question to the respective speaker uh, and I hope that, that the three of you uh, are then ready to, to get back to us uh, in case there are any questions. Um, this webinar will become available on YouTube just like always um, and I would again like to thank Pedro, Gail and Beril for their availability and for their super um, enthusiastic and passionate presentations. Uh, I hope to see you all at, uh, at the bootcamp uh, in the European Space Week next week. Um, my name is Hannes from the Accelerator team and I wish everyone a fantastic evening. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.